Bright MP for Dobell. Thanks for speaking with Central Coast Newspapers. Uh, in the middle of the campaign, you've only got a little way to go. How's it going first up? Well, we're in the home stretch now. Um, mm. Dobell is always a very tightly contested seat. Uh, so I've been, we've been working very, very hard to be able to listen to as many local people as we can to really understand what their, what their concerns or priorities mm. are heading into the election and to be able to give them a real clear choice um, for what I believe, if we can form a future Labor government, is a better future us, for us on the Central Coast. So with the, this campaign, uh, what are your three, what are your, some of your priorities? I, I won't limit the number, but what are your priorities? I know I've read the campaign materials. Health is a big one, but what is the one locally? Yeah, uh, so I'm a pharmacist and mm. I, I used to run the pharmacy department at Wyong Hospital and not long after I was um, elected, Wyong Hospital was put up for sale. Mm. It was going to be privatised by, by the state government. And so for me, um, you know, health and health services for local people is mm. absolutely critical. In our community, one in five people are aged over 65 mm. and we have a lot of young families. That's the times, the two times in your life when you most need local health services. And as a pharmacist and as a local MP, I've seen people wait weeks for routine appointments. Uh, people who are having to decide whether they can afford to fill a prescription or not. Um, people who um, you know, are ending up in the emergency department mm. because they can't get the care they need. So healthcare services locally, more GPs, affordable prescriptions. And we've been able to secure a commitment that if we do form a government, that there'll be a Medicare subsidised licence for the new MRI that's arriving at Wyong Hospital. So that for me, uh, as a local person, um, and from what I hear from the community, mm. people want, they want that assurance to know that they'll be able to afford healthcare when they need it. We've also announced that if, if we are elected that there'll be two urgent care clinics on the central coast. So the situation where someone, you know, um, has an accident or an injury, you know, um, need to get in to sit, get care, mm. um, but don't need an emergency department. And we've seen these work really well elsewhere, including in New Zealand. Mm. So these are things that I think will mean that it um, eases the cost of living, um, you know, by reducing the cost of medicines, um, improves access to, to doctors, and also will really help to reduce the demand on our already overstretched um, public health system here. That's a big issue up here. We've followed it for years in the newspapers. Uh, people report reportedly can't afford to go to many doctors. Many doctors are not bulk billing at the moment. So these clinics, tell us a little bit more about them. They're federally funded clinics. They're sort of not quite emergency clinics, I take it. Is that is that how they are? So, so what Labor will fund is um, 50 um, urgent care clinics. And an urgent care clinic will mean that you can walk in and they'll be open from eight o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, and all you need is your Medicare card. Mm -hmm. So you can walk in, it might be that you've had a sprain or a cut, or you might need um, some, some stitches, or you might, uh, and what it means is that you'll be able to walk in, that you won't have to pay upfront or out of pocket, uh, and that you'll get the care that you need on the spot. Um, and so the big advantage that we've seen in these clinics around the world is that in New Zealand, they've reduced presentations to EDs significantly. Um, and what that will mean that someone will get care sooner, they'll get the care that they need, uh, and then they'll, they won't end up in an emergency. So, the, because the hospital system, the effectively statement hospital system is very overstressed um, over during COVID and staff issues, what outcome will they have on, on these hospitals? So what it will mean is where we've seen um, elsewhere where urgent care clinics have been introduced and they've been introduced in some states of Australia, including in Queensland and the ACT, that we see a reduction in presentations to emergency departments. So we see reduced strain and pressure on the already overstretched emergency departments. We know that our local hospitals at Wyong, sorry, our local hospital at Wyong and Gosford, see they're always in the top five or 10 for emergency presentations across the state. And if we can ease the pressure on the emergency department and at the same time provide care that people need uh, close to home that they can afford mm. then that'll be a good result for our community and for local people so what are some other priorities uh, from what you've heard on the ground and what, what are you going to do about mm. um, another really top priority for me um, is our local economy and local jobs as someone who went to school in Wyong and high school in Tugra there's always been challenges, not just for young people, but for people to be able to, to get into work, um, to have a steady job and a good career. Before COVID, one in four people were commuting outside of the Central Coast. Um, we know that we've seen under the 10 years of this government, a reduction in almost 10% of apprentices in training on the Central Coast. 
these are all things that have an impact on, on people and households and on our local economy. So um, Labor has a number of measures that we've introduced um, that will help that, but one that I'm particularly proud of and that we're able to announce only this week is a food manufacturing hub on the Central Coast in Lizarow. This is something that has the support of the Regional Development Authority, of the University of Newcastle, of Central Coast Industry Connect, um, and of the business chamber and of the local business community. And what it will mean is an injection of over $17 million of federal funding for a food innovation hub to be built in Lizaro. We know that it'll provide 85 jobs during construction and more than 200 jobs ongoing in food and beverage manufacturing. What it will provide is a pilot facility where someone who's looking to commercialise a line will be able to do that. It'll also then build skills within our community, people that can hone and develop those skills in food and beverage manufacturing. It'll also attract investment. The Central Coast already has food manufacturers that are recognised locally, whether it's East Coast Juice or Sanitarium or Mars, that are recognised locally and around the world. And what we've seen through COVID is that countries like Australia are seen as a premium producer of export quality products. And that's what we could see, you know, um, products going from the Central Coast to around the world and really, really investing in local manufacturing. Now, this has been, uh, this has been under wraps for, for many years. I know Frank Zamet and his team have worked on and talked about food manufacturing and getting it going for many years. Are you aware of all the work that they've been doing in this regard? I would absolutely like to acknowledge um, Frank Zamet, um, Alex, Central Coast Industry Connect, John Mullen from the RDA, uh, the University of Newcastle, um, Paula Martin from the Business Chamber. This, this is an example of a genuine collaboration where we have seen over years um, the work of all the partners that have made this project one that an incoming federal government would be able to properly back to see enormous uplift for our community. Okay, well that's uh, jobs. What other uh, priorities have you? Yeah. Um, for me, the Central Coast has always been a really beautiful place to live. Um, my family originally were generations ago from Brush Creek in Yarramalong. Um, and what we've seen uh, particularly um, well over the years, one was the Wallera 2 um, coal mine that was proposed in, in our water catchment. Mm. Uh, the other that we've seen um, was the PEP 11. Mm. Um, the Central Coast is a beautiful place to live. What we need to do is make sure that we preserve and protect our environment. Um, it, it is unique um, and it's something that we need to make sure that we protect for future generations. What many, so many people in the community were worried about was PEP 11, the petroleum export permit um, off the coast uh, between Sydney and Newcastle, just five kilometres offshore, where we could have seen oil and gas exploration. We have been able to, um, by working with the community uh, and people being really strong advocates, um, to be able to force the government um, to finally say that, that PEP 11 will not go ahead. Um, but the Resources Minister, Keith Pitt, um, has been a strong proponent of these type of projects. Um, and, uh, you know, it took advocacy over years for the government to finally bow to community pressure um, to say that there won't be, you know, oil or gas exploration off the coast. I think that is something that is critical um, for our community uh, and, and, and for the future. And this is something that we have a responsibility um, to do. Well, Australia apparently is the world's largest exporter of liquid petroleum. Um, why can't we have some of that gas? Most of it, we're told, goes to Korea and China and Japan. Why can't Australian industry have some of its gas quarantined and fed back here so we can have good, good priced energy? There are so many opportunities. Australia could be a powerhouse of renewable energy whether it's solar, wind, hydro, you know, there, there is so many other opportunities. Um, so it just does not make sense uh, for a government to back in, you know, petroleum or gas exploration off our pristine coastline, which would risk our marine life, uh, would risk our coastline, and would risk the local economy. So many jobs that are built around tourism, hospitality, uh, you know, that would be at risk by projects like this. Well, you know, the Labor Party, with its traditional worker base, particularly in the Hunter Valley, um, with, with coal and so on, how do you propose to transition? How does the party propose to transition or deal with 
those well-paying jobs and uh, the new energy sector. Mm. And this is something that, and you would think, and you've seen um, that the, the plan that that Labor has that Labor has introduced, and, and our shadow spokesperson Chris Boran has spoken about what we've been able to do is really, if Labor's able to be elected, is end the climate wars, mm. where we'll be able to see, um, you know, a transition uh, where we're investing in the energy grid to make it more stable, where there is proper investment in renewable energy, um, and where we see an investment in, you know, over 400,000 um, TAFE, free TAFE places and there is a skill shortage mm. and a real opportunity to, to really um, become a powerhouse of renewable energy and at the same time create jobs, a good jobs of the future. Well, the government, at least the state government, um, and uh, Treasurer and Energy Minister Matt Keane has, has, uh, has included this area into a renewable energy zone. Uh, do you and the party support that sort of uh, state government initiative? I think where we can, um, you know, to be able to work, you know, um, with with the state government um, and, and incoming federal government to be able to really look, um, realise the potential that we have here on the central coast that has been harmstrung by by these, you know, and, and I'm hopeful that if we are able to form government, that we can really you know, see um, that real opportunity for regions like ours here on the Central Coast and across Australia. Now, I know you may have another priority to uh, to talk about. So uh, what, what what are some other priorities for the, the electorate? Yeah, um, so for me, um, aged care. Mm. It's something that I know is close to many people's mm. hearts and um, many people know that um, I lost my dad to younger mm. onset Alzheimer's. and. In our community, as I mentioned earlier, one in five people are aged over 65. And we've saw, um, I know many people were shocked by the interim report of the Royal Commission that, that was titled Neglect. Um, and I have heard from so many people and families about their own experiences. What people should have is dignity. Um, you know, and, and people should know that they will be cared for properly, that they'll have quality care. How are you care. going to do that? How, how are you proposed to do that? So, so, um, we have um, listened very closely to people who, to, to individuals and families and people that work within the sector. So what Labor has, has said, that we will adopt the recommendations of the Royal Commission, that we will have registered nurses, you know, back in aged care homes, um, that we will have 215 minutes of care so that you know that your loved one, your family member, your parent will get the care that they need. Uh, we will also make sure that there's transparency and accountability because what we have seen is where, where public money has been invested uh, that it's not going into care uh, and it's not going into properly supporting the aged care workers. We'll also make sure that there's standards of nutrition and working with the Maggie Beer Foundation so that people will, in some aged care homes, we know that people, that they're spending less than 6 to $10 a day on food. Um, you know, everybody um, should be able to have, you know, a nutritious meal and something that older Australians should just have. So these are some of the measures that we're going to, if we, if we are elected, to introduce to make sure that everyone can get good quality care. Emma, I just wanted to ask you one of the hard questions about wages. It's in the debate right now. Your leader um, has put it on the debate. In the context of aged care and health care, mm -hmm. Uh, I know you've been there side by side with the nurses and midwives. Yeah. What's your stand on that? How yeah. is that going to be solved? Yeah. Well, we need to see people working um, in in care. We need to see them properly paid for what they do. We know at the moment some aged care workers are earning twenty two, twenty three dollars an hour, and when I've met with them and heard from them, they're stacking several jobs on top of one another mm. in order to be able to put a roof over their head, and we know that many nurses and midwives are only working you know, many fewer hours than they could. So by properly paying workers in care, we will see, we will see an increase in the hours worked. We, we, at the moment, there is a wages case um, for workers within aged care. And, and Anthony Albanese has said, and Labor will support that wage case at 25%, which will mean that people have living wages in order to be able to do the work that they do. So it'll, it'll keep more, it will retain more workers currently within the sector. It'll also mean those working within the sector are able to work more hours. And what it will do is create proper career paths for people so that someone, you know, I would like to think a young person today 
uh, you know, would be would be open to and excited about the prospect of working in disability mm. care or aged care or within our local hospital system. But, but people working within those sectors need to be properly paid in order to put a roof over their head and to do the work they do. Speaking of roofs over heads, roofs over heads, the rental and the property uh, market here on the Central Coast has become very, very difficult. We've published stories of people leaving the area with families because they simply can't find mm -hmm. anywhere to rent mm -hmm. or to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is the fleet of programs that Labor intends to do about that? Mm. So we had um, Jason Clare, our, our housing and homelessness spokesman. He's visited the Central Coast a number of times. Um, he's met with Coast Shelter, he's met with Pacific Link, he's got a really good understanding of our, uh, of our community and the needs. I mean, I grew up in Wyong and, uh, you know, and I, in, this is the hardest that I've ever seen it for people to be able to rent mm -hmm. or to buy. We know that during COVID, that property, that prices went up 21% across Australia. We know on the Central Coast, they went up 31%. And we know that on some parts of the coast, including Wombrel, which is in this electorate, they went up 47%. Uh, that puts it out of reach for someone who's grown up on the central coast uh, to be able to you know to be able to buy where they grew up uh, or someone to be able to live anywhere near where they work but because surely the, the young workers of which you just spoke of um, who want career paths if they don't have anywhere to live they can't work in these facilities in the food industry that you've talked about and so on so mm -hmm. it seems to be in a very acute crisis that you know, to get workers is not just about paying them, but they need somewhere to live. Mm -hmm. So there's there's um, a number of measures that um, Jason Clare and Anthony Albanese have spoken about them. One of them is the regional home buyers program, mm -hmm. and what that will mean is that up to ten thousand people will be able to each year will be able to buy. They won't have to have lenders' mortgage insurance, and they can have a deposit of five percent. So what that could mean is with the current that that would save someone up to thirty two thousand dollars. But just there too, I mean the government's doing a similar thing in that regard, but there was the 40% equity uh, offerings where the government would put up up to 40% of the purchase price of a new home for a middle income um, family. Um, has this worked anywhere else in Australia, that sort of thing? It has, and um, we've seen that this has worked very well in Western Australia over a very long time, mm -hmm. um, and we've seen it work in other parts of the world. And what, with that particular program, then the government would have equity in the home. The person would need a deposit of only 2%, um, and they also wouldn't have to have lender's mortgage insurance. A and what Jason Clare has said, that with the caps, um, that they would be reviewed every six months to make sure that they stay you know, current with the housing market. And we know that this has worked very successfully in other parts of Australia and other parts of the world and it's another opportunity for someone to be able to to get into home ownership. So when the house is sold is that when the government's equity stake um, is returned back to, to government coffers is that how it works? So there's a period of time mm -hmm. um, uh, after after the home is sold and it might be in the situation the example we had where it was you know um, whether it was a, a parent that, that passed away mm -hmm. so there's a period of time um, when that equity would be able to then go back. But what it meant is, what it would mean then is that that person would then end up with a share. Mm. Um, whereas otherwise, that person, you know, that money would have just gone in rent and there wouldn't be any equity mm. um, for the family to be, able to, to be able to share. And what about new homes? I mean, we've, we've had our contentious um, negative gearing scheme for many years that many people uh, avail themselves of, but it doesn't seem to be hitting supply, at least on the Central Coast. What's Labor going to do about supply of houses on mm. the um, and, and Jason Clare and Anthony Albanese have spoken about this. And I think when Anthony was here, he was with his partner Jody, who grew up in Well Street, just around mm. the corner from where we were. Um, and, and this is there. There is definitely in Australia that there is there is a supply problem. Um, and we would work with with industry, um, with the state governments, as Jason pointed out, that the current housing minister has not met. The federal housing minister has not met with their state and territory counterparts. So this is something that needs to be a whole of government approach, working with state governments, working with local councils mm. in order to really boost supply. The last big boost in supply we saw was in the global financial crisis when Brendan O'Connor was housing minister under Gillard. That was the last big increase in supply we saw of public or affordable housing in Australia. We know compared to comparable countries, we have much lower rates of affordable housing. So this is something that needs to be a concerted effort working and if, if Jason was the incoming Minister for Housing and Homelessness, there would be Jason would work very closely with the state and territory counterparts, with local governments in order to boost boost supply. 
um, so that we know that housing can be more affordable now and into the future. Well, the state government has, in its regional plan, um, ha has tens and tens of thousands of new people slated to come up here. Would you work with the New South Wales state government and our our council, which I won't say anything about, but the, the, our council to hasten the, uh, the the development of these these properties? Well, what we know that is in the state government's 2036 plan that they're expecting more than 70,000 people mm. to come to the Central Coast. And in that, there's an estimate of about 40,000 dwellings. Mm. So this is something that there would need to be a coordinated and concerted effort. And yes, if, if we were able, if I was re-elected and were able to form government, I would work very closely um, with Jason Clare as, as the federal minister and, you know, the state counterpart and, you know, with local government in order to see that, make sure that the Central Coast gets its fair share so that people who grow up here can afford to buy here, that people want to downsize and come to the Central Coast can, can afford to do that and that we can create an environment that has got the right infrastructure mm. that people can be able to, you know, live here, work here, retire here. Just a few things towards the end, Emma. You were, in fact, a councillor in Wyong Council uh, for some years, together with a, a board director on several not-for-profits here. What are we going to do about our council? When do you think? I mean, I know you have no jurisdiction over it directly, but what do you think is going to happen with our new amalgamated council? What we have seen was um, a forced amalgamation that, that was underfunded. Uh, and we've seen the state the state minister has now had a, a public inquiry. Um, some people, many people were calling for a judicial inquiry, inquiry, but there has been eight recommendations from that public inquiry. Um, the minister called me and briefed me on those recommendations. What I think the community want to see is, is a council um, that is there working for all of us, uh, that, that where people can have their say uh, and where we can see really so many opportunities of Central Coast be realised by having a council that is working with the state government, with the federal government, in order to get that what the Central Coast deserves. What I find really hard to see is whether it's, you know, um, Wollongong in the south or the Hunter to the north of us, and where you see where the Central Coast is missing out on opportunities um, because we just don't, at the moment, we're not able to take advantage of them. So if we're in the situation where uh, you know, where we are able to form government, mm. um, that I would be, you know, very keen to see the Central Coast ha have a strong voice and a representative voice uh, so that people do have their say. Speaking of representation, there is none at the moment. It's under administration. It has been for a long time now. Um, would you be supporting a call for election so that we actually have councillors now or do you think the council is ready for more incoming uh, councillors? Um, from having um, worked very closely with my state counterparts, um, we're likely to see, I understand, um, an election probably next year. Um, that, and I think that, that you know, we've got the federal election now mm. and we'll have a state election in March. Mm. Um, so we're, we may see um, some change in our community. I think what people want to see is the chance to be able to have their say that they can, you know, that they can speak to a local councillor um, who will then, you know, represent them and their community. And that's what I would support. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for speaking with us. Pleasure. Yeah,